Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Uh, you know, apologies for not getting this out sooner. I really meant for uh, part two of our conversation with Dan Slott to come out on Sunday. But, uh, man, it has really been crazy. I have a, a part-time radio job where I'm doing traffic, both producing and anchoring for uh, the CBS news station here in uh, Chicago. It's WBBM. It's AM 780 and it's FM 105.9. Uh, in fact, I am on the air late Friday night and late Saturday night into uh, Saturday and Sunday mornings from midnight to 6 a.m. And uh, Friday night, uh, oh, I should say 1 a.m. because, uh, okay, <laughs> scratch all that, uh, and I'll give it to you in Eastern times. Starting at midnight Eastern time on Friday and starting at 1 a.m. Uh, Eastern time on Saturday, I'm on straight until 7 a.m. Eastern time. So there you go. And do the math for Pacific and Central time. That just makes it easier. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, it's fun, but it's also crazy, and it's really turned my, my body clock around. So I'm, I probably sound a little loopy right now. But anyway, uh, that's why. Uh, and um, so uh, that's just kind of delayed things, and we were just really busy. We had very serious rain that made uh, road travel very tough. And uh, made the uh, traffic shifts very intense. So uh, it, was, it was a very interesting weekend. But uh, this is uh, Monday night, uh, technically, uh, as far as the European audience goes, early Tuesday morning. And I'm bringing you part two of the uh, Dan Slot episode. But a couple other things. Haven't had a chance to watch the History Channel uh, Superheroes Decoded two-parter. I, uh, I have it on the DVR. Hope to have uh, comments on it on the next episode. But I noticed on io9 and Gizmondo that uh, they have uh, released, uh, or they, they found online, uh, Evan Narcissi. I hope I'm saying your name right, Evan. But he wrote a great article about that lost 1979 comic book documentary. I did presentations with it at C2E2 a few years ago and uh, at San Diego Comic-Con. And it's very interesting footage. I don't own the rights to it. I really felt uncomfortable putting it out on YouTube. I'm glad it's now out there, uh, but it's interesting. A couple things. Uh, it's the full footage that I have. I have a different copy. And um, frankly, uh, this uh, account on YouTube, stock footage uh, compilation or footage file, um, I, I don't know how they got it. They've got interesting time code stamps on it that are easy to put on a modern uh, thing. And clearly this is uh, the time codes you see are certainly post when this was actually filmed. Because of the difference, um, I don't know. I know there are there are a few other copies because I have a friend who is in the library sciences uh, business, and he was able to search for the film and look at all the library data banks. And we found like three or four schools and public libraries that still had copies of the sixteen millimeter print that my friend bought. And my friend bought it from uh, an eBay auction of a library just getting rid of their stuff. So, you know, but to actually, like, put it out on the air and stuff like that, it'll be very interesting. I hope somebody claims the copyright, just because I'd like to know who made that television series and get more information, because we really only have just a little bit of information. Uh, Evan talks about it in his article, and I will link to that. I'll also link back to uh, when I did the presentation of the episode uh, at C2E2 or at Comic-Con. I think I'm going to do the C2E2 one, because Mike Gold is in it. Uh, he's the first guy you see. In the, fo in the footage that's on YouTube, and he's going through the DC archive, and he's looking at the first uh, issue of Detective Comics 1. So um, I, I'm glad, like I said, really glad it's out. I want people to see it. I want to look at the count right now. Uh, as of this, uh, you know, the, I think Evan posted his article on Sunday, and uh, there's already over 10,500 views uh, on YouTube of this. So gl good. I'm glad it's out there. And, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to go back if you didn't listen to that Word Balloon episode uh, with Mike Gold, because uh, it's really interesting to get, you know, what he remembers from it. And we just got so much. I mean, it was shot in 1979. Um, and if you haven't seen it, it's uh, a really big look at the comic book business in 1978 when it was shot, or 1979. And it's um, in the offices of DC and Marvel. Uh, I know we've, ta again, old Word Balloon listeners know. But uh, you see footage of Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill, and Julie Schwartz. Uh, it looks like they're going over sketches for Superman versus Muhammad Ali. Uh, on, in the Marvel side, you got Stan Lee and Archie Goodman 
uh, Goodwin, excuse me, going over the uh, designs for the human fly, which I think is really interesting. And you also get to see uh, a very young John Romita Jr. rocking a Billy Batson uh, Shazam television show. Uh, long, long hair. It's all right. It was 1979. He had disco hair. All good. But uh, he's an intern, and you see him in the background. Uh, Trevor Von Eden and Jack Harris go over uh, the splash page for the first issue of Black Lightning. And uh, DC Comics Hotline, you hear Joe Orlando uh, on the phone, the former great editor and EC Comics guy. Uh, Joe Orlando talks about some new DC books uh, on a uh, kind of payphone, dictaphone sort of service that DC had very brief- briefly in 1978. I- I'm assuming, literally, right before the DC implosion. Very interesting time for DC. And uh, equally Marvel as well. And I really think people will enjoy seeing this footage. So uh, I w- I'll put the link on uh, Word Balloon. And, uh, you know, hopefully it's still out there. We'll see what happens with this, though. Because, as I said, it would be interesting to see who owns the rights to all this. All right, all that said, let's get into our conversation with uh, Dan Slott. It's going to be a really fun talk, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Word Balloon today was brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. And uh, there are tremendous deals happening this week at InStock Trades. I'm uh, bringing up the page right now to rattle off some of these things. I know because really, let's be honest, the trades that uh, everybody's been putting out have really been exceptional lately. Uh, let's see. Well, we've got things like uh, the War of Kings Prelude hardcover, which is the Road to War of Kings omnibus. There are uh, plenty of writers and artists involved, but uh, this is uh, during that great epic from uh, Abnett and Lanning, uh, Marvel Cosmic stuff. And uh, we've talked about this run with Andy Schmidt, who was, of course, the uh, the editor of that run. Andy Schmidt, one of those guys at C2E2 that I saw from afar but didn't have a chance to say hello. So we waved to each other. So we had that much going for us. This book is uh, just shy of 1,200 pages, 1,192 pages, 42% off, $72.50. What else have we got? We've got uh, Avengers, the epic collection. Uh, this is, wow, let's see, we've got Roy Thomas and John Buscema. Uh, among other artists, but uh, this is collecting Avengers 41 through 56, the first two annuals, um, and then X-Men from uh, the original run, number 45, and material also from Not Brand Eck. But uh, Roy Thomas and John Buscema bringing you the Avengers. 50% off, it's just $19.99. I know Roy's controversial right now, but uh, politics aside, good Good writer. And that was a great run of the adventures. So check it out from InStockTrades.com. Mark Wade and uh, Chris Somney doing Black Widow. This is volume two of the trade paperback. No More Secrets. It is uh, 42% off, $10.43. You can get uh, Captain America, volume two of Marvel Knights. This is when uh, Kirkman and Dave Gibbons and Robert Morales, the great Robert Morales, who's no longer with us, Lee Weeks, Chris Pachalo, um, J. Scott Campbell, and... Um, I want to say Scott Eden. Am I right? I think so. Uh, but uh, that's a great collection of uh, those early 2000 stories of Captain America. 42% off. It's just $20.29. We've got Green Lantern, uh, Sam Humphreys, my buddy, along with uh, Jackson Herbert. Uh They are doing a great run uh, featuring, of course, uh, Simon Boz and Jessica Cruz, the young new Green Lanterns. Uh, this is volume two of their run. It's 42% off, $11.59. All from InStockTrades.com. Check out all the details now at InStockTrades.com. All right, back to this conversation with Dan Slot. We still haven't talked about Silver Surfer. We get a bit into uh, the legacy issue that, uh, you know, obviously uh, people are talking about and thinking about when it comes to Marvel. DC is embracing its legacy now uh, with Rebirth. And uh, Marvel is obviously about to do the same this summer. And, uh, you know, Dan has thoughts on that. And uh, rightfully so, because, you know, Dan got crap uh, for the Superior Spider-Man run. Uh, Air quotes, killing Peter Parker was almost as uh, outrageous as Captain America saying Hail Hydra. Um, I think, uh, again, I think this is worth discussing. And I really appreciate um, the creators that do want to talk about it and, and do because, again, it's this is good, man. The whole conversation is good, and it's going to move things forward, uh, you know, no matter what, if you, you know, feel so polarized that you're angry either for not enough legacy and and not enough uh, old-fashioned Marvel comics to, hey, we want more diversity. Too bad. You've got, you know, 65 years of uh, the old way of doing it and stuff. Isn't that enough story? Can we get our chance? 
Interesting conversation. Is there room for both? I think there is. I think most of us think there is. But Dan's willing to chime in on that. So uh, let's get into it now. Uh, Dan Slott, part two of our conversation on Word Balloon. Did you ever see uh, Steve Wacker's uh, improv show? No. Oh, Jesus. Steve, the way Steve Wacker kind of broke into the industry is he had an improv show where it was his show. He designed it. He built it. He picked his his version of the Groundlings. And I want to say it was called Kazam. Where he had like a troop of like sketch people with him. Yeah. And the it, it was great. I think I saw it like four or five times. The uh, And I, I didn't know Steve. Uh-huh. Like. And what he would do is they would fold in part of the gimmick. They would fold into the cast every now and then someone from the comic book industry. Okay. And it <laughs> would, would be like a, an extra special guest star groundling. Okay. And they had a um, – they had like these coat racks that were filled with costume pieces that you could slap together to make yourself a superhero. Masks and capes and doodads. Okay. And they had a a guy on a synthesizer piano, and he was pretty good. And he could do every now and then. He would go into like the Lonely Man. Yes. Or bling, one. Bling, bling. <laughs> yeah. Or or the Wonder Woman theme. Or believe it or not, you know, it was really good. It was all superhero stuff, and and he would do an improv kind of score. And the way it worked was. Steve played the role of like a Stan Lee character <laughs> who was the like the owner and you know of Kazam Comics. Okay. <laughs> and the first half of the show what you did was everyone everyone in the show if you were in the audience you wrote down on a slip of paper your idea for like a superhero name or a supervillain name. Okay. And they all went into like a big hat. And then the show starts and he would be telling you the history of Kazam Comics. And it was very much – there was a kind of Mad Lib-like structure. Okay, yeah. It was – this first half of the show was always kind of very similar where he would walk you through the golden age fighting – you know, where the heroes sure. fought Nazis and, and work you through the 60s. And he would walk you through the history of his imaginary um, – <laughs> yeah, imprint. And he goes, which led to our, you know, our surprise character of the 60s. And he reached into the hat, you know, like the golden plumber. <laughs> <laughs> and then like the poor groundling would have to quickly cobble together the costume and jump in. <laughs> and then they'd uh, everyone would throw out stuff and you'd quickly get like they'd act out like a scene from Golden Plumber's comic. That's awesome. And, they, and then they'd move on to the next and he would tell the whole story of Kazam Comics. And then at the end of the first half, right, um, the audience would vote on what their favorite Kazam comic was. And the second half was an all new feature length adventure <laughs> of that character with that's some cool. of the other guys coming in for cameos. That's really but, cool. Jesus. It, it was this great – you never knew what it was going to be. It was like this – it was a great show and Steve was very funny. And that's how people in the comic industry kind of met Steve because people would go to this show. That's genius. And that's what eventually got him over to DC Comics on editorial as an assistant editor. Yes, yes. We uh, when, when he's been on, we talked about that. And, God, it's been forever since I've had Steve on. And, and I'm sure he's got great Marvel yeah. animation stories he can tell me. Yeah, he's the god of Marvel animation now. Yeah, yeah. No, and you know, he really flattered me because he's from downstate Illinois and used to listen to the sports station I was on. And it really blew my mind where he's like, you know, I used to listen to you. And I'm like, get Uh, out of here. And he goes, oh, yeah, man. (laughs) He he lives for the Cardinals. That's cool. That's cool. And it's so funny to meet the – because obviously the the normal thing is, no, I'm not into sports. I like sci-fi. I like this stuff. And I understand. I get that. And I'm kind of – I'm a little bit of a sports fan, and certainly being in sports radio, was forced to watch a lot more sports during my, my 16 years in sports radio. But, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I love it now when I do, you know, the Ron Marses and um, Frank, uh, Frank Thierry is a big sports fan and B. Clay Moore is a big sports fan. So there's a few guys. Lemire, Le- Jeff Lemire is a big sports fan, big I, fan, obviously. I, I could honestly not give a shit. I <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Brian, so Brian's mean. the same way. It's I don't care. Did I just lose you? 
Not at all. I'm here. Can you hear me? John? Can you hear me? Are you there? Yeah, I was there the whole time. I don't know what happened. I'm not oh sure. Oh, my God. I did my I did my I'm being silly and I'm not caring. Oh no I'm, no that was funny and it all, it's all run. recorded. Don't worry about it. We got it. And all. then and then the sound went out and I'm like, oh my god, I was doing a bit. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes sometimes my connection gets oh wonky for a second and I lose people that way. I'm glad it's lasted as long as it did. But no, we're fine. We're good. I was so scared I offended you. Oh, not at all, please. <laughs> and Jesus I was doing Christ. a bit. No, uh, no, because I'm like the least. I'm one of these people going, let's talk about the sport ball. I hear you, man. No, you know, no. I, I have no idea what anything is. Like when we have uh, Marvel retreats and then uh-huh. we after the retreat we all go to a dinner or something. Sure. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, we all go to a dinner. <laughs> I, I kind of – there will be times where I end up sitting next to Axel Alonso. And Axel loves sports and all this stuff. And I'm, you know, Mr. Doctor Who. And he's all like – did you see that boxing thing and the basketball thing and the thing? And I'm all like, I, I don't understand the language you're talking. Oh, now if Axel's into boxing, I, now that I can talk to him about. I covered boxing for uh, for 20 uh, years. Axel, yeah. He, he, whenever – it's kind of funny. It's like whenever we have these things where you find out, oh, Marvel's doing some kind of cross-promotion with the NBA or Marvel's doing some kind of thing. That's the point where like Axel's all like, who do I get to meet? What's going on? Oh, this is great. We should do this. You know, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. That's it's it, it's it's weird. It's like I think you see all these wrestling stories on Marvel dot com and oh yeah, and and so much of that is because everyone on Marvel dot com loves wrestling. That's you see now wrestling. I I, I had my time in the eighties. I'm not uh, well versed enough. I felt bad. Aubrey uh, Citizen uh, is oh. Huge. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And invited me on to his wrestling podcast. And I'm like, you know, I really don't keep up with the current stuff. I thank you, but I, I really would have nothing to say. And I really wouldn't be able to, like, be, a, a, you know, much of a guest for you. I said, unless you want to talk about the history of wrestling. He's like, no, not really. I'm like, all right, <laughs> take it easy. <laughs> no no hard feelings. So we just talk comics. It's fine. Yeah. Is, I'm, I'm, I, I am so weak on wrestling. I have no idea what's going on or who anybody is, except, except for just a couple of guys that I care about. I'm fast, honestly, I'm really fascinated by the business end of it. And I mean, God, uh, I, lo- I do love a good sports documentary. And ESPN's 30 for 30 series is so good. And they just did one in the last year about the XFL, if you remember, uh, Vince McMahon's football league. And even that, just from a broadcast and and behind the scenes story, to me was fascinating. So, I, I, it's weird for me because uh, you get me to watch a sports movie, I'm all over it. Did you see Creed? Yeah. Oh, Creed was amazing. Yeah, Creed was great, man. Creed was oh, Creed was so good. Yeah, um, yeah. I love that they took the uh, the ending of Rocky Two that was supposed to be like Lady of the Tiger, and they just told you. They just told you. Yeah, I love that. Well, they you kind know? of they kind of telegraph it in Rocky IV at the end. Yeah, when he, is that what you're talking about? When he uh, when they have their their little third match and everything. Yeah, when they have their third match and it's just private, and then they freeze frame it. Yep. Yeah. So I I love that. Oh yeah, no, it's good stuff. Because yeah, because Rocky comes back from the the fight at the beginning of Rocky IV, and his son's like, uh, "What happened to you?" He's like, "I was just in a fight." Yeah, but you don't know who won. That's true. That's true. You don't know who won, but and Greece. Creeps- Oh, yeah. Creed comes out and tells you the, but yeah, you you know, you, the it's you get me to a baseball game, and I you know I every now and then I, it's fun, like it depends who I'm going with. If I go with my dad, that's great. Sure, but um, but you you put me in front of a baseball movie, I'm all over. <laughs> like, yeah, isn't it interesting how I really do think, and I mean, usually you know we're we're, we're usually going to get the happy ending. And we yeah. know, but you know, somehow the 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 best filmmakers they they trick you into, you they suck you in. Oh, oh, you 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 know anything? Field of Dreams, The Natural, Eight Men Out, um, Bull Durham, Bull Durham. I love Bull Durham. You, you, you know, you give me a baseball movie, I'm I'm there. Yeah, it's you know, I, you might like. It's almost like Kevin Costner's done a trilogy. With, I was going to say Ron Shelton. Yeah, the filmmaker Ron Shelton. Everything he does. Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Actually, it is a trilogy because it's it's Bull Durham for the love of the game. What's the third one? Uh, Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams, of course. Yes. Yeah. The um, the, the it's like all that. I'm just I'm all over it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's so weird. I can I will 
eat up a boxing movie, but you make me watch boxing live and it's barbaric and I hate it. I understand. And, you know, I'm really worried that the same things that they're discovering with football players that see. Oh, God. I, I really have. a. In fact, and and believe me, I always say this because if I have uh, Muslim listeners, I hope I don't offend when I say this. But I was really hoping that when Ali passed away, that mm. they would have done an autopsy on him. Aye. And I don't want to desecrate the body. But yeah, it's just but I, I have a friend whose father was a heart surgeon at uh, the Chicago hospital where Ali had his CAT scans that kind of discovered his Parkinson's syndrome. And I was such a fan, and this was even during the, I want to say, 84 Olympics, probably mm-hmm. the 84. Yeah, probably was the 84 Olympics. And uh, he's like, John, if you saw Ali's CAT scans of his head, you would not be a boxing fan anymore. Yeah, I, I can't. There's And, yeah, now with, with the NFL and, and all this, it, 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 it takes away from the game. Because yeah. I, I remember being a little kid, and when you're a kid, you – you know, your empathy levels suck. Um, and I remember watching like a game where someone got hit really hard and it took him out of the game. Yes. And as a kid, I was like, great. That guy's oh, out. Yeah, of the it's game. drama. Oh, it's dramatic. Oh no, no. Like we could win now. Our oh, team, I see. I see. Our sport, our sports team that represents our city can win. Yay. Cause that guy got taken out. And, like it's a video game or something. Right. And, and then like, you know, I remember saying something like, you know, Another, you're like, oh, what they should do this thing and take that guy out. And my dad's like, no, that's no, like that's <laughs> that's bad. Yeah, you don't you don't do that. And you know, then you grow up, and it's you know, it's the same way when you're a kid. You play war games, right? Right. You, you know, play army. Sure. You sure. play army, and then when you become an adult, you go, war is the worst thing in the world. Yeah. yeah. And you don't yeah. do it. You know, uh, with football, I, I mean, not to bring up a, a sore subject, but you're right. I mean. Gail Sayers was one of my childhood heroes, and I literally only caught the tail end of his career, but certainly grew up on the stories as well. And then when I got into sports radio, he worked at our radio station. Plus, he and his wife had bank accounts at the bank I worked at while I was trying to break into radio. And his wife in particular remembered me from the bank and was like, John, we're so proud of you because we knew you when. And it just meant a lot, and I became closer to them uh, because of it. And unfortunately, Gail is suffering from Alzheimer's, and they believe it's football related, and it's it's the worst thing in the world. And yeah, it's like my God, my hero, who was so unstoppable, uh, you know, as a running back and just this incredible football player, is I'm, you know suffering now. I'm I'm going to say horrible things because the, the, there's certain things like you shouldn't draw analogies, but it's um, people. A lot of people don't realize like. These things that you love and you care about are these things that uh, give you pleasure and escapism. Mm-hmm. The 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 heart and effort and time that go into it, and sometimes you feel like an asshole for talking about it because you're like that guy over there is lifting heavy boxes and digging ditches, like that's work. Um, but like I look at stuff like um, you know like George Perez, mm-hmm. who, you know, or. Uh, like uh, Giuseppe Camagoli, he to hit those deadlines to get those books out, he bends over that table, his wrist, his back, he he wrecks himself, yeah. so that he can do X number of issues a year. You know, get, you know, we we're in a day and age where, um, you know, outside of of Camagoli, Diodato, Bagley, um. Mike Allred's in there, uh, John Jr., Umberto Ramos. There aren't that many guys that can can get, these guys can give you twelve issues or more a year. I hear you, Mike Norton's like that too. Yeah, but most people in the industry can't do that. Yeah, most yeah, yeah, industry, yeah. most guys in the industry now, you know, you get eight issues out of somebody, uh, ten issues, you know, maybe even six or less. The the, the you know, and it's how editorial manages all that. Um, but the, the, they're, they're these heroes that you don't, you know, they, they put in that time and they put in that work and they have this professionalism and they get that job done, Yep. you know, and it's, they hurt themselves to do it. And it's weird to think about it cause you, oh, it's, it's drawing, it's doodling, 
You know, the, the, you no, know, it's not, it's work, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, and it's time it's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm on this side of the screen and I get to go a cast of 10,000 characters pours over the hill. Yep. Send. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Good luck. And then, <laughs> then some poor jerk has to draw it. Um, yeah. I was working with Dan Jurgens on a justice league story and, I had written these like cast of thousand scenes and and all the and, and it, these really obnoxious notes in them like you know like where there'd be like a sea of people and I was like but none of them are for central casting they're people from all different cultures all different walks of life <laughs> you know and anyone who came over to the the apartment and saw the eleven by seventeen xeroxes like for balloon placement anyone who saw this stuff. We'd go, oh, this is beautiful. And anyone who came over who was from the industry saw it would look at it and go, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like you, 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 the longer – it's like that I kid who goes, take that guy out. No, you, 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 the longer you do this, the more you go, man, I got to you know, I gotta be a nicer person about this. I'm, I don't want to break or kill anybody. By the way, Jurgens uh, right now? What? Uh, I, by the way, Jurgens right now, mm-hmm. right in the hell out of Superman. Uh, he's, he and, he's... He and Tomasi, I'm telling you, it's. I just said this on my episode I released today with uh, Jim Zub on a commercial mm-hmm. for one of the trades. I'm like, literally, Superman is in the best hands it's been in for, in the last seven years. Really, since Robinson and Rucka, I think, were writing Superman, it hasn't been this good since when Straczynski took over the book and really, you know, it took a turn into the brick wall. And, oh, and I don't think they recovered don't, don't, for a long don't time. Don't put me in a spot like that. Well, I'm saying it. I'm, Dan, I'm saying it. I understand. And I'm, these these aren't your words. These are my words. But I'm just saying, back to the good stuff. Jurgens is do, doing a great job. Thank you. Oh, absolutely, man. No, 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 no. That's not, I, yeah, these, are, these are only my words. Don't worry, man. I, I saw a reviewer on a site I'm not going to mention uh, talking about another writer's work. And they phrased it in such a way where they can, you know, none of the people we're talking about are me. My ego isn't that scary. It is, but not in this case. Okay. But this this reviewer from this site was talking about how good this one writer was. And they went, on oh, there's so much better than that other writer who worked on this book for a year. And it's like, why you got to be a dick? I hear you. Why, why you got to... Why can't you just talk about how great that writer is? Why do you got to bring the other writer in? And, you know, oh, God. Sorry. And, and no, yeah, no, no. I but, apologize. Uh, good. good. Good young man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, You're it's, right. That's true. I should be more polite. That's true. And I know I'm a big hypocrite for saying this because, you know, I, I feel I can talk this way about the comic industry because I'm in the middle of it. Yes. And someday I might have to ride up in an elevator with one of these people. <laughs> but, you know, I, I will happily go on for hours about how much Batman versus Superman sucks. Then I don't I don't imagine Zack Snyder sitting in a bar drinking going, why did Dan Slott writer of that 60,000 copy book say that about me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, to be fair, though, I, I never at Zack Snyder. I never at him. <laughs> I hear you. Well, yeah, well, you personally attack him and go, you suck. Yeah. I no, no, no. Yeah. And send it so that he'll see the tweet. No, I don't do that. Yeah, I don't do that either. I, I and I was disappointed in the last two DC movies. We'll see what happens this year. I was actually. I, I am. No, no. I am really excited for the Patty Jenkins uh, Wonder Woman. Me too. I hear great that, things, and my my friends who've seen stuff are like, "Oh, it's going to be great." And I'm like, "Good, yay! I want a good. The, I absolutely yes. want a good one." No, no, movie. that that trailer looks amazing. Every version of it, I True. think. Um, Wonder Woman was the best part of Batman versus Superman. Agreed. Uh, I am I am really looking forward to seeing a female director with a female yeah. lead superhero telling a kick ass story. It. I am so. You see that um, the reaction they got when they released that um, uh, Last Jedi poster? Yes. With the shot of Rey holding up that lightsaber and like, (laughs) and you have this female, strong character. Nothing is sexualized in that whatsoever. Yeah. 
just being the action hero and watching all of fandom just react in this really positive way. Yes. It's, it's weird. It's like, and it's, it's so common sense that, um, like when you're watching, uh, force awakens Mm -hmm. and they do that one quick cutaway, like they have all the X wing pilots doing those, that raid with Poe Dameron. Mm -hmm. And there's that one quick clip to the female Asian pilot. And there are people cheering in the theater. Yeah, yeah. And and it's just pilot number three, you know? <laughs> yeah. But it's, look, that's me. I'm up on the screen. Yep. And I get that. I get that so much. I mean, uh, when I was a kid reading comics, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very unobservant now. But as a kid, when you're, you know, under the wing of the family – um, I, I was far more an observant Jew because I was forced to. Okay, sure. And, and we practiced, you know. Uh, but I wouldn't see Jewish heroes. You know, I wouldn't see I wouldn't see me in the comics. And it and it took until you know uh, Moon Knight, and then when they they showed that, and then Moon Knight, when you think about it, is the worst Jewish character. I had no idea Moon Knight was Jewish. That's hilarious. Yeah, he's Jewish, okay. but. He's, He's he's the bad man who uh, does all this evil stuff, has a near-death experience in a pyramid in front of an Egyptian god. <laughs> and the ghost That's of the true. Egyptian god gives him a second life to be a good person. That's interesting. I, wow. That's yeah, true. And, that is kind of embarrassing. The, it's terrible. It's and and when it, it, it's up there with like you know was, that was Mark Spector always Jewish or was that I'm, a retcon thing? I don't know if it was retcon, but I, I was very aware that he was Jewish. And there's a story where his rabbi father is mean to him and he punches him out. And I'm like, wow. yeah, that's great Jewish character. Wow, I yeah. loved I loved when they it wasn't was it you who who retconned yeah. Ben Grimm to be Jewish? Carl Kiesel. That's right, because I remember hearing Stan's reaction. Which... <laughs> well, of course he's a Jew, <laughs> you know. No, but it, here's the thing: it's yeah. But I, I was the guy who gave him a bar mitzvah. That's um, awesome. <laughs> because, but yeah, it, it's the only Jews that you saw in comics for the longest time were Doc Samson, who gets the shit kicked out of him all the time by the Hulk. Didn't know Doc Samson was Jewish. Go on. You know, Leonard Samson, who gets the power of Doc Samson, <laughs> who's a doctor, a, you know, a psychiatrist. Come on. I didn't realize. He he was the Jewish Jew Jew character there was. <laughs> the, 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 and, of course, he, he gets his ass kicked all the time because um, he was a secondary character. Right. Yeah, totally. But uh, there was him and then Kitty Pride, and right. she was wearing that Star of David all the time. God bless. Yep. And so – but then she becomes the co-ruler of Limbo with her satanic roommate. So <laughs> – <laughs> What about There's, Sabra? The, oh, Sabra in the Hulk. Uh, part of me, I'm wondering, did I kill Sabra? I'm trying to remember if I killed I her. Know. I don't, might kill have. Elk or something? I, I might have. I, I want to. It might have been an Avengers the Initiative thing or something. Or or over in Mighty Avengers. I had this vague feeling I killed Sabra. Oh. But maybe I didn't. <laughs> um, the, but... Uh, there were very few Jewish characters over in uh, Legion of Superheroes. You had Ragman, who was Jewish. Um, Ragman and, for well, he wasn't in the Legion. He was uh, Joe Cameron uh, character, right? Ragman. Uh, yeah, no. Over at DC, you had you had you had Ragman, and you also had Colossal Boy, was Jewish. I forgot that Colossal Boy was Jewish. That's hilarious. I, I think his family even lives on like Future Kibbutz. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I think they actually live on a space kibbutz. That's awesome. Space, you know? By the way, that should be like in print now is space kibbutz. <laughs> yeah, you know, and Bendis would write the fuck out of it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's like you didn't see your own people. So sure, I, I sure. totally get it. When when someone shows up and you you see yourself in the book, it means everything. We, you know... I they they told me I had to take part in um, uh, original sin. Okay, um, sure, yeah, yeah. Like I had to take part in it, and what was uh, I knew it, original sin? I don't even remember. Uh, it, it was you could either have 
a secret your character has kept from everyone. Right. Or a secret that was kept from your character. Right, right. That, and when the eye explodes, everyone learns all the secrets. So I pitched one of the secrets that was kept from Spider-Man is that the Spider-Man, the spider that bit him lived long enough to bite one other person. And that, that character was hidden. Um, and everyone's like, Oh, that's, you know, Axel really loved that. Okay. And, he, and they were like, originally I just wanted to do it as one annual off to the side and, you know, stay focused on my story about black cat. And this character kind of took over the whole story um, and it was silk. silk. I was that was say, that was silk. Okay. And yeah, and I remember being in the meeting when they were like, "Okay, uh, who you know?" And there's a mis- there's a mystery spider that's been in hiding. They, you know, Ezekiel gave them the offer that they gave Pete, and that's why you like that's why you haven't seen them. They've been locked up in a you know in a what, like a lost hatch for all this time mm-hmm. in a bunker. And now, now they'll Peter will free them out of the out of the bunker. Now, ooh, what's he like? I'm like she. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> I had I had nothing. I was just like <laughs> you know, they're like oh, and and then I was thinking you know if we're creating a new you know female spider character, and this was before Spider Gwen existed, right? Yes. Um, I was like, uh, dear God, let's not make her Caucasian. You know, sure. like. You know, so I was like, she's Asian. And they're like, oh, you know, and, and it was really something that just kind of just this desire to not have her be one more white character in the world yeah. of, of superheroes. And the amazing thing is when I go to cons, these people come up to me in silk cosplay or people come up to me with like original art or, or sketches they've had made of silk and they want me to autograph it too. Cause I'm silks, you know, co-creator yeah, yeah. with Umberto. Yeah, and yeah. what inevitably happens is this speech, you know, of how much silk means to them and how much it means being seen. I hear you. And, and you're like, Oh my God, it's, it, you know, it, you feel this honest, the, you feel this, obligation that when you go on to create any new character to add as much of this as you can to let other people see themselves like um i'm i'm friends with toby whithouse who's uh he's the creator of the tv show being human okay Mm -hmm. and 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 he writes uh, lots of doctor who episodes and he did a two-parter last season um with uh before the flood and, uh, you know, with that whole town that gets submerged and the ghosts with uh, Capaldi. And um, there's a character in there who's running the base who um, is deaf. And at no part in the story, you know, is it treated like a superpower or a plot contrivance. You know, it's it, she happens to be deaf. I hear you. Um and he, it was just a choice he made while he was going. And then when the episode came out, you know, they were invited to talk at schools for the deaf oh, and, cool. and for all these things and to bring the actors. And he just saw the reaction that it had with all these kids who, who saw themselves now yeah. in the world of Doctor Who. Yeah. That he was telling me like over a lunch, like, I'm doing this now with everything I write. Like, why does the world need more new characters that are like, you know, that look like the generic characters of everybody else? Yeah, I agree. When when you have the chance to really make it reflect and it would, you know, are you going to get one more butt in the seats if you make it a white character again? You know, if you you, this new character you're creating for the purpose of a story. No. No. You know, did anyone care that, you know, like, look at how many people enjoyed Moana. You know, all these little kids all over the world. Mm -hmm. And does Moana look like you, you know, for most of the kids? No, but you don't care. Yeah, of course not. Of course (laughs) You're just, you're into the story. Right. And, And then the benefit is, if you are a child who looks like Moana, that movie means the world to you now. Of course. Of course. And it's this thing that you will you will carry with you forever, and and it's the thing that can in, in empower you and help you, and 
you know, it's the it, it it's an equal part of normalizing something, but then also an equal part of empowering something. Sure. That is, yeah, yeah. That's why the the Jew thing meant so much to me as a kid. Sure. Because there is also the more you learn about comics, you're like, oh my god, this is almost an entire industry built by Jews. And none of the characters are Jewish. Right. Well, unfortunately for the the wrong thinking stigmas that were there, especially during that era, uh, I yeah, it's it's lousy. The only and I completely agree with everything you say. Uh, my my uh, frustration, and it came up recently, was the uh, the debate over well, you know, there's too many uh, white characters. Let's. I think there's room for the new characters without sacrificing the old ones. That's my, um, that's my that's my only feeling. I, I get it, and this is a, a debate worth having. Yes, um, as I took a, a, a stand very much when they were talking about the casting, which eventually became Tom Holland uh, for the new Spidey. Uh huh. And uh, my take on it was: cast anybody, get the best actor. Sure. You know, I don't care if spider-man is you know black or asian or you know hispanic or whatever get someone because peter parker is an outsider Mm -hmm. peter parker comes to this is like this outsider from queens yep you tell me an outsider from queens you know it almost makes more sense for them to be black yeah or or or, you know, or any kind of and person of color, rea- yeah, any color, yeah, any color. The, the reaction I was getting online was astounding to me because there'd be so many people saying, no, Spider-Man is white because he has to be white because he was white in the comics. I get that because like when I was a kid, I get the whole I want it to be like it's in the comics. When I was a kid, not when I was a kid, when my niece and nephew were kids their favorite meal of all time is Kraft macaroni and cheese. Then you make them Kraft macaroni and cheese and they're happy. And there were such, you know, addicts to this. The one time I came up to them, I was like, I'm, you know, uncle Dan, I'm taking you out to lunch. I'm taking you to the best mac and cheese in the city. And I take them to a fancy schmancy restaurant and they're all happy. They're excited. Even though we could get Kraft and macaroni and cheese at home, they're all excited. We're going out to this fancy restaurant. We're going to get this great mac and cheese. And they bring it out, and it's got Gruyere in it, and it's got <laughs> bread com- breadcrumbs baked on top and white cheese, and it's just uh, – it looks beautiful. And they take one bite, and they're like, this isn't mac and cheese. Yep. And they are really upset. And I'm like – to the point where I had to get them to box the stuff. I had to take them back home. I had to make Kraft mac and cheese for them, and then they were happy. You know, yeah. and and so I get it. I get that this is your comfort food, especially yes, exactly. comic books. Yes. And I want Kraft Mac and cheese. And if you give me this other, you give me some gluten free, you know, Gruyere baked this on top. That ain't what I want. I get that. I totally get that. You change <laughs> you change the recipe. Right. So but then there's the flip side of it. There's there are the people that genuinely get offended. At the idea that Spider-Man's not white, not because of this, that, or the other, they're offended, you know. And no, those are the people that really need a different Spider-Man, just so that you, you know. So uh, there, there are people that were offended. I had this view because their take is that steals from Miles. You know, sure. you can't have a black Peter Parker because then what happens to Miles? Right. And then my take is well. Miles isn't just black Spider-Man. Of course not. If all Miles is is black Spider-Man, then we've got a problem. He's a character. He's right. a beautifully well-developed character. Um, the, uh, yeah, so it's it's a weird world where something like that engenders so much passion. Um, uh, yeah, I understand. No, hey, man, and I know, you know, it was uh, that the debate has obviously been brought up recently, and I get it, and I'm glad you made the macaroni and cheese analogy. I said DC and Marvel are like McDonald's and Burger King, and I think it's fine that they offer more than burgers on the menu, but some people are coming for burgers, and I would say don't just don't take the burgers off the menu. That's mm-hmm. And it's that simple. I, I just think that, you know, again, I think it's great. That, you know, we've got a Korean Hulk and we've got 
uh, you know, a female Captain Marvel and go down the list. And I think it's fantastic. Um, Captain Marvel's different because, of course, Marvel has been dead for 30 years now and stuff, and that's fine. And I, you know, great Marvel was great in his time. Uh, but I mean, that's the thing is, and especially when it's done all at the same time. In fact, Dan, your I, your your Doc Ock as Spider Man run came up in a, a discussion about this, and it's like, no, it was a fun story. It's a great story, and it and it pokes you in the face, and it makes you rethink what is it that makes a hero in I, in that particular one. But I just think if if it's all happening at the same time, that then you might get some readers that are like, you know, I came here for a burger, man. No, I that is an argument I completely understand. Sure. That, you know, I, I think with a lot of the stuff that Marvel was doing, that it, no one, there wasn't a mandate. There wasn't someone saying across the board, you know, Depression. everybody change. Yeah, I hear it. What there was, was there's a lot of individual writers who had stories they wanted to tell. Sure. Rick, Rick wanted Sam to become Cap. You know, Jason had this whole plan for Jane to become Thor. Yep. And the problem was it all happened at the same time. And since it all happened at the same time, like when we were growing up and we were reading comics, you could do a big story where Captain America throws off his mask and his costume says, I'm never being Cap ever again. I'm now Nomad. Right. John or or the captain and John Walker suddenly shows up. But go on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, But you can do that Nomad. Right. story you right. can do that and when you look at the marvel universe at that time everybody's in status quo and there's one piece out of play yep and yep. you go well that's interesting yep um but if you suddenly do a story where sam is cap and jane is thor and doc ock is spider-man and everybody isn't what they usually are and it's not the one piece it's the whole Marvel universe at the same time yep. is being looked at through the funhouse mirror. Then you're not there, there's no ground to stand on. It, it's almost like you walked into an alternate universe, right? You know, right. there is. It's like it's almost like I I need some anchor. You know, um, right? I wasn't an Eric Masterson fan necessarily, <laughs> but that was really the only. Oh, status no, no. quo's change of its time, and obviously again no. it was a different white no. guy. No, 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 no. Oh, tell me, you, correct me. You had, you had like Eric Masterson running around the same time that uh, Rhodey was Iron Man. Oh, I totally so, forgot about it. And I love. And by the way, that was there's a great story of you know, holy shit, look at where Tony Stark is in his life, and mm-hmm. you know, thank God Rhodey is there to pick up the slack and be like, well, somebody's got to be Iron Man. Yeah. So there, there was a time like before Rhodey became War Machine, and and but the, the yeah, but as long as it's only one or two points, right, right? They're floating. But if suddenly everything is in upheaval and everything is different, then there's there's nothing to gauge it against. Um, it's it's weird because like when we were doing Superior Spider Man, uh, we were setting it up. There, you could kind of feel a resistance in the room. And what it was like, so many people have changed history. I saw someone give an interview where they flipped it, and Marvel was convincing me to do Superior Spider Man. I'm like, what universe did that happen in? <laughs> it was such an uphill fight. You know, I'm not going to say get the interview, but I just, I saw, I was like, wow. It, it's one of those things where success has many fathers, but. You know, at that point, I was one of the many fathers who got disowned. <laughs> Somehow all these other geniuses came up with this, you know. Sure. And Umberto, Umberto Ramos and Ryan Stegman and I, we we had to be tied down to <laughs> convinced. You've got to do this. You must do this. <laughs> no, but it was it was originally we were pitching this and everybody, everybody in that room was trying to either talk us out of it or make it a six issue arc. Almost everybody, because, you know, and the reason they were pushing for six issue arc, and then the, some of them changed their tune to 12 issues when they realized we were a, a bi-monthly book, a bi-weekly book, uh-huh. because they realized in this day and age of six issue arcs that whatever stories they were doing, they could set it before it or after it and avoid <laughs> it. But if you made it longer than six physical months, then suddenly 
Doc Ock Spider-Man was going to show up in their stories and they would have to waste a panel or two to tell their readers, oh, by the way, that's really Otto Octavius. Sure. Sure. But that's not what they want to do. They want to tell their story. Well, but, you know, there's your stories that, like, and that was Superior Star- Spider-Man was a great story. Then you have Blue Superman. Uh, oh, no, yeah, oh, like no, Blue but, Superman, you know. But, but what I'm getting at is that uh, they, there was this, this point where, because so many guys who come to Marvel, you know, whether you're writing Avengers or Fantastic <laughs> Four or whatever book you're writing, like the way I, when I was writing the thing, you want Spider-Man to guest star in your book. Right. You know, you grew up loving Spider-Man. You and now you Spider-Man, you're, you know, yeah. Yeah, well, this is what we talked about earlier. Yeah, by all means, go yeah. on. Now you're working at Marvel, and God damn it, you want to write Spider-Man. <laughs> and, and suddenly this asshole over here is making him Doc Ock's brain and putting him in a weird costume? No, I want him in the red and blue, and I want him quipping, and, and, and he's going to guest star in my book. Right. So everybody was uh, trying to shrink the story down because they realized it was going to mess up with their whatever they wanted to do with Spider-Man in their books. And at one point, Axel or somebody was suggesting, well, is there some kind of switch? Is there some kind of thing where where Peter can emerge, <laughs> you know, and, and put on his suit and go over and, and, and be in the Avengers and have this adventure in outer space? And when it's over, the Doc Ock persona can take back over? And I was like, no. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Because <laughs> if he does that... The first thing you should say is, holy shit, hey, everybody, Doc Ock is in my brain. Time <laughs> down. Fix this. You shouldn't go, oh, I've got four days to be Peter Parker. I right. better. Yeah, oh, thank God. I'll, I'm going to certainly keep this ordeal that I've been going through to myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 now I better use these four days to help the Avengers fight the Kree. <laughs> but when it's over, Doc Ock can pop back in. Yeah, I killed that <laughs> as fast as I could. Hilarious. But that was like one of the talks that came up. Hilarious. So Everyone's everyone's got their thing, um, yeah. No, but I hear you. So I yeah, it's just it's it's all for both. I mean, no, that's no, the thing. Like, let's no, no, you know. no. It's, it's it's also crazy because you were saying Blue Superman, and you're saying Blue Superman. Ooh, boo, hiss. And I got to tell you, you read uh, Grant Morrison's JLA at the time, right? And he's writing Blue Superman. Yes, he was, and he had this one scene. Where they put these magnetic poles on these, like around the moon or something. Go on. And he uses these metal poles, and he uses it to change their polarity. And from strength of will, using his electric powers, he moves the moon. And that moment took Superman in a strange place, and made him the character Superman for everyone. Interesting. You know what I mean? Because okay. he's, he's Clark, he's in this body, he's got these powers, but he's moving the moon. Right, like you, he used to, like he pushed planets back in the 70s and 60s and stuff. Yeah, where you go, holy shit, you've just given me one of the, this truly iconic Superman moment. Interesting. In a, in a time when he's in, with the characters in a funhouse mirror. Right, right. They care about Superman again. That even if he doesn't have these powers, he will find a way to move the moon. Is more Superman than some Superman that people will write in the correct co- in the normal costume. That it's all it. how you approach the character. Well, sure. Well, you, that's... Even, if, even if someone does one of these, you know, strange new takes. Well, that's why I liked New Krypton when James Robinson and, and Rucka were writing Superman in action comics because, you know, it was Kandor was brought to full size again. They populate New Krypton. And Zod and... Um, uh, Allura, uh, Super, Supergirl's mother, are like, you know, you only know Jor-El's point of view on Zod and his movement. Maybe you, maybe Jor-El was wrong. And maybe Zod isn't the war criminal that you think he is. Maybe it was politics and he was a freedom fighter on the wrong, on the wrong, you know, on the non-majority side. And all of a sudden, to see if that's true, Superman <laughs> allows himself to go to this new Krypton, doesn't have the powers, and is living as a Kryptonian for the first time. And it's, I thought it was an excellent journey into Superman's character and taking him out of the blue suit. And it's like, okay, how does Superman be Superman when he's under a red sun and can't rely on his powers? It's the same thing with Jason's story with Jane and the Odin son. What is Thor when he is not Thor? Good stuff. Great, interesting, interesting ideas. But like yeah. you said, if it's all happening at the same time, 
you know, hey, I'm, I, I came for my burger and fries. I, I, you know, this is a great story, but can I also read uh, what, you know, and again, I think Jason's doing it uh, in Thor because you've been oh getting the Odin's son's story as much as you've been getting Jane's story. Well, you know, this, there's a weird thing that happens to me now at shows. Uh, and it's been going, no, it's been going on for some time and I get it multiple times per show. I, I can get it multiple times per day at a show where at, at each time, you know, it used to be people would come up to me for, you know, signing superior Spider-Man stuff where they'd be apologetic. Sure. I understand. You know, I remember the shit you got during that time. Yeah, Certainly. Go on. Yeah. They go like, oh, I was such a big complainer of this story and I really love it. You know, this sure. is my favorite runs or whatever that I used to get just that. And now I've been getting this extra layer, which blows my mind where it's someone says this got me into comics. I wasn't reading superhero comics. I knew who Spider-Man was from the movies or the cartoons, but I wasn't reading the comics. But I heard like someone talking about it. Doc Ock's brains in Spider-Man's body. And that was so weird. I had to check it out. a boy. Good. You know, and I'm like, this was your entry to Spider-Man. These were the first Spider-Man comics you read. I'm like, yeah. And then I went back and I read the other stuff. So I'm like, someone th that blows my mind. And I get a lot of this that someone reads superior. That's how they're introduced to the character. And it excites them enough about Spider-Man that they go back and they read all the other stuff going back to Stan. And I'm like, that no, there's something wrong about that. He's the funhouse. You met the funhouse mirror first. And then the thing that tops that sometimes is pe some people say, this was my entry into comics. And that blows my mind even more. <laughs> you know, because it's like your entry into comics you know now you're gonna go off and you're gonna read hicksville and saga and you know everything under the sun you're gonna read this because you read about fucked up spider-man first <laughs> <laughs> like what the what the hell <laughs> is angelina is that um doc's Girlfriend. Oh, uh, Anna Maria Marconi. A Anna Maria, thank you. I I, I forget her. I, I forget oh, her no, name. No. And I'm, I'm... I I I get people, you know, uh, uh, close to threats of "Don't you do anything to Anna Maria?" I and well, you know, her role in Don't Clone Conspiracy. Her role in Clone Conspiracy was great, and her conversations with Otto were fantastic. She's she's fun. I I love writing her. <laughs> uh, there, there are certain characters that like. Um, uh, we'll have to revisit this another day. Okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil things. Of course, not. There, there, there's there's stuff where I'm like, oh boy, um, like with, with Flash Thompson. Um, there, there's certain things that I, I think people don't understand that I do sitting in the Amazing Spider-Man chair. Where when you're sitting in the chair for, uh. You know, yes, you're not an editor. You're you're a writer, and you can be fired any second. You, you know, you're not. You know, uh, the it's the editor who makes the hard calls and the tough choices. Um, but but there are certain responsibilities to being in this chair, and um, there's certain things I take very seriously. And like one of the things that as long as I'm sitting here, and it's it's my even though they're not books I don't work on. Um, one of the things I'm, a uh, as long as I'm there, I'm, I'm, this is a sticking point for me and I, I fight it every time. So many people have tried to change it. Uh, Flash Thompson doesn't get his legs back. It's a, you know, it's, you go, that's, that's a weird sticking point. That's a weird like thing to fight for. Um, but we've gotten so many, um, wonderful letters from wounded warriors. Sure who who love what Flash is and that Flash keeps going on and Flash is a hero and he does this while being a wounded warrior. And there there are numbers of times where someone will come on, you know, someone will want to use Flash or someone will want to take his story to the next level where they go, oh, what if the lizard serum grows his legs back? What if this grows his legs back? What if this gives him his legs again? And I do everything in my power to kill that. 
even though it's a character I'm not writing because I'm, I get to be the guy working on Spidey. It's one of the things that scares me if I ever step away from Spider-Man is someone's going to give Flash Thompson his legs back. I understand. Oh, I hate that. That, yeah, that, no, that's, that makes perfect sense, and I'm glad that you know disabled people and specifically uh, wounded warriors can, can find solace in Flash. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. There, there's, there's so many things that, like, you know, that people don't know that different people do different things to, you know, stand on the wall uh, for all kinds of different reasons. Um, it, it's weird when there's people you really care about, like working on a book or in charge of a franchise, you know, and all these little fictional things that mean so much to all of us. Um, it's weird that like once they go and then changes happen, you don't realize, Oh, that was the guy that was doing that. <laughs> I didn't appreciate them. Sure, man. <laughs> uh, like there, there's so many different things I, I try to do while I have this seat. And like one of them is to make sure that like there's certain things that we've done during amazing, um, that Marvel never asked me to do that. I just do. Um, like in every major arc or in different stories, I try to build up a character so they can go off and become a spinoff. Um, or there's a platform for this. And Mm -hmm. sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't like, um, in the case of, uh, like all the, the places we moved Kane around on the table by the time we got to spider Island that healed him and made him this character that, that was like, okay, now we can do a Scarlet Spider Kane book. Yeah. And Yost killed on that. And that had a really healthy long run. Yeah. Um, but then conversely, I'll do this thing where I I do like a reclamation project where I make this big mysterious character in this hidden room. And then you find out, oh, it's Morbius the living vampire. <laughs> and then it's like, ah, good. Now we can send this off over here and it become a Morbius the living vampire book. <laughs> and then – that one that one didn't click. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. Sure. Sometimes you get uh, Silk. Sometimes you get, uh, and, it, and it has a really nice, healthy run. And then other times you do the Prowler and you just get the five or six issues. <laughs> I hear you. And it, it's frustrating. Oh, yeah. um, you, the, uh, someday I want, to, I want to tell this story. I don't know if it's soon enough uh, or my place that um, the Prowler book was going to have a it was going to have its, this very unique identity and a very unique premise and you weren't going to get to it until this big twist at the end of the last issue of the the clone conspiracy story because the feeling was uh, well, we have this cool twist and a cool setup but we had this feeling like clone conspiracy was going to do gangbusters and everything related to it was going to be great. And you had enough time to do a slow build up, And then the numbers just weren't there for the Prowler book. So we actually had to change our plans midstream so that we didn't end the issue with the, you know, bum, 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 here's the twist. <laughs> because it would be bum, 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 here's the twist. And we're not going to do anything with it because the book is over. Wow. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, like yeah. it kills me that you, no one really got to see what, what we were going to do with the Prowler. And a lot of that is it's our own hubris um, thing that we had the time to do a slow build. So you're like, oh, man. You know, and I was watching people like online immediately like diss the Prowler. Like, why are we doing this book? Why, 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 why would you do Prowler? I'm like, oh, just wait till you get to the premise, which we never got to. Well, that's the thing, Dan. I think, honestly, uh, you know, some ideas are meant to be, you know, sub subplots in a story. And mm-hmm. some, you know, I, I understand the ambition of trying to spin things off into new books. But, you know, yeah, sometimes it's too much new product. And, yeah. You know, and it doesn't find its own. And also, I, I respect the fact that these books are budgeted and it's, it needs to, you know, cost this much to make, you know, it needs to cost a, to make B. And yep. obviously you got a guy like David Gabriel, who I think does his job incredibly well with that. But it, it also means that sometimes if, you know, the initial orders aren't there, 
Yeah. What, what's going to be an ongoing becomes a miniseries and goes away. This is the way of the world. It yeah. is. The, it, Marvel is in the business to make money. Sure. And they want you. They want to put out entertainment. And if it if it's not supported, um, they go and will find the next thing. You know, or or. I just think it moves too fast, though, Dan. And, I, and again, I don't expect you to have an answer to that. But it really, I understand. But it's some, you know, again, it's no, it's a more crowded field than it's ever you, been. You you can say it that way, but you got to keep taking the chances because if you don't, you don't get the Squirrel Girls or, or Silk or, or some of these other or Spider Gwen or, or some uh, of these things. Absolutely, moon, but don't. Moon, you, but we'll, no, but like we'll you, you, absolutely. Yeah. You, that you know, you put out these books, and then one will hit, and then you get that, and everyone's like, "Why don't you do more like the one that hit?" Well, sure. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way. <laughs> of course not. Because you don't know what's going to hit. You know, imagine we could take that time machine and go back a year and go a year or two and go. We're going to do a solo book about the vision. You know, I'm like, why are you doing this? Why are you wasting the paper and the staples? And then it's, oh my god, that's one of the best comics in the past ten years. Absolutely, no question. You know, no question. And, but it, if the same people that snipe about why are you doing this? Why are you doing? Why are you doing a Prowler book? Why are you doing this? It could have been the next big hit. Anything can be the next big hit. You know, if if the magic is there, if people step up to the plate. If uh, they hit the ball well, you know, if it connects with the right audience, if word of mouth builds, there's like a million different variables that you never know where that big hit's going to come from. I-, I remember working on She-Hulk, which I think we're being generous if we call it a cult hit. Yeah, um, but, uh, nah, you know, I, I was going to bring up the fact that because of Marvel Unlimited, I went back and reread a bunch of She-Hulk of yours and really enjoyed it. And I forgot but, how much I enjoyed it the first time around. But he, let's be very generous. It was a cult hit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, how, many is, issues did, how many issues did you get to do? We got to do, I want to say, 31 to 30, like 31 to 33 issues. Yeah, that, that is impressive. No, but, Go but, on. We, Go on. But Buckley and the powers that be when this thing isn't selling as well when we did our first run and they went, this thing has legs. You guys are doing a good job. We need to kill this now, give it a little bit of a rest and bring it back in eight months and relaunch and we'll give you more push. Okay. So so okay. It, had a, it had issues one through 12 and then it, then it took a, a small like, you know – vacation and then it came back with the new volume two number one um and and that one made it for over 20 issues and then peter david uh stepped up when i had to step down okay and and then it went on for a a good nice chunk of time Uh, so but but when it originally started i think it's generous to call it a cult hit right no and when i remember complaining you know, like I remember going like, why aren't you guys promoting this book? You know, come on. You know, like you're promoting that X-Men thing. You're promoting New Avengers. You're promoting all this other stuff. You're doing, you know, posters and giveaways and, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z right. for for these this amount of promotion for these things. Where's the promotion for my tiny little book that could? And people had to explain the economics to me that like – if we spend X amount of money promoting the little tiny thing and it doesn't pay off, we've now wasted that money. But if we spend this amount of money promoting the big thing and it exponentially brings in so many more readers, that is money well spent. So the frustrating thing is if, if you're the little thing that could, you kind of have to – even at the big company, you kind of have to make it on your own. Unless there's, you've got a guard, you know, some kind of patron saying, you know, some kind of person that went, this is a hit. We, we're going to put some more muscle behind it. You know, some people, they do that every now and then. Or if something is suddenly taking off like vision and getting good word of mouth, they'll get behind it. We got to push this hard. We'll, we'll, you know, like they took vision and they gave a free issue of vision with one of our runs of Spidey. 
Oh, I didn't realize that. Go on. If you bought like an issue, you got a full issue of Vision. That was to the dealers or the retailers or to the Um, consumer? No, it was bundled in the book. It was like a special extra sized, you know, issue and it cost normal, but, you know, it was double sized. So they put an issue of Vision in the physical copies of Spider-Man. Yes, they, they. It just became a double size issue. Okay, and you know, and that way, like, if all these Spider Man readers got to read Vision, I think it was, it was Spidey. I might be wrong. I'm pretty sure. Okay, but like they they did that with an issue of uh, the Inhuman book. They put it in Spidey as well. Okay. But sometimes there's certain things we can do to get you to like. Here's a free thing. Because well, um, that's interesting. Because I thought Vision's success was more organic, and my question was going to be. Barring trying, something like that, I'm trying it, to. Rem- I'm it, trying to. Re- I'm trying to remember. I might be wrong on vision. Well, but I was going to say, isn't isn't social media and the blogosphere enough now to get the Wednesday warriors who do follow this stuff? Is uh, is there not enough there? Because I, I can appreciate not wanting to spend publicity money, but I just the the point you made about She Hulk. Reminds mm-hmm. me of another book that uh, was given a lot of opportunities to succeed, and that was Jeff Parker's Agents of Atlas. And mm-hmm. I thought, you know, I'm, I was a huge fan of that book. Next Wave is another example like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, on, on the DC side, I know, or I should say specifically Wildstorm, Sleeper had shit numbers, but Jim oh, Lee loved, loved what Sean Phillips and Brubaker were doing. That- that's an amazing book. Of course it is. Of course it is. And they got to finish their story. And, um, oh, God, Steve Gerber and I forget. Oh, it was Brian Hurt. And I can't remember the Steve the Steve Gerber book that was on DC's Focus Line. That was such an interesting and an ambitious story about the kid that was sentenced to life in prison. And, oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he can astral yeah. project. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I bought every issue of that. Was it, it Hard Time? It was Hard Time. Nice going. Yeah, Very that was good. that was. That was an amazing cue. Well, that, that came out of nowhere. Well, that's that- the thing, and that's what concerns me sometimes. And I think this is where um, where Marvel sometimes gets b- a bad rap is that you know because those first issue orders or second issue orders don't meet that expectation, and immediately it's like kill the book, and it's like you you wish that there was a little more gestation time. And again, no, it's-, it's easy for me to spend Marvel's money, but exactly. It just, but it does <laughs> seem like. Books were given a little bit more time to live and also weren't under the the incredible competition of not only the other regular books, but the amount of tie-ins, you know, some of the other product that, that Marvel puts out. And it's like, God, can you just let people it's, get a chance to fucking find the book and at least see how the first trade does before you kill the goddamn thing? It's, it's frustrating. Um, like with, with the thing, you know, I yeah. – I, busted my ass going out there trying to get people to 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 read it yes and 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 tried to do like an online you know thing called pull my thing yes uh, um, <laughs> I remember that uh, yeah that, dan yeah. i think that was our first conversation was you promoting the thing and and, and i'm 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 almost 90 i'm almost 100 percent certain that that was the case Go on. I, I, I was trying so hard to just get people to see it and the frustrating thing was um when Marvel gave it the axe, how many issues did you get? We got uh, it was going to go to six, and I was given the option: Would you like to do two more? Yeah, that's right. I was going to say it was like eight issues. Go on. Yeah, so I I took the eight because I wanted to wrap up as many storylines as I could. Yeah, yeah. For anyone reading the book, um, not leave it hanging. Um, the uh, the frustrating thing is by the time we'd been given the ax and told people it was canceled, the numbers had just started to pick up, you know? So it's like, it's, it's frustrating. If, if your book is a low, you know, if your book is a low seller, um, waiting for the trade, isn't going to help it. Okay. Because it could already be axed yet. If you dare say this, if you dare go on social media and say, oh, please promote this or it might get axed, then all these very progressive liberal people will come out and be, oh, boo-hoo, Marvel is saying this. 
you know, buy more indie books. Screw Marvel. Why are you promoting? Why can't Marvel do this? Or you're trying to blackmail us into buying your book. Or you know, you're you're saying we aren't getting diversity because we didn't promote this book, but we didn't like it. You're like, no, we're just saying, dude, we're just trying to give the book a shot. It's a lot of people working a lot of hours trying to do sure. this thing, and it's the time where you, because you work for the, one of the big two that people kind of turn their nose at it where um, because there are, you know, there's only so much oxygen. Right. And, and for, you know, you run around and you try to promote a Marvel book or a low selling Marvel book. There's also a feeling like there are hardworking people on the streets doing their indie books and you're eating up that oxygen. Um, it, no, the it's great, not easy, man. I hear you. The you know, and and you're one of the corporate tools pushing Marvel. You're a shill. <laughs> you're like, no, we're, we're just every single person out there, from the person working on the indie book or the ash can, or that low selling Marvel title or low selling title from one of the big two. There is no one in the world who's working in comics, and you know this. There's no one who fell into it by accident. Yes. Everyone is doing it because they love comics. And there, I can't think of a single person who phones in a comic. Agreed. Agreed. You know, everyone wants it to be good. You know, you can you can say, you know, I suck, but you can't say I phone it in. Right, right. No, I I, I, I say that all the time about stories. That, oh, you, you, know, you say I suck? No, is I that, no, I is that what you say, John? John, I'm coming through the Skype. I'm going to kill you, John. No, I, no, I, no you know, I no, I always say like when an event doesn't isn't well received and stuff. It's like if you ask a writer, why did you go? Why did you make that left turn? The answer is invariably, I thought it would make for an interesting story, and, what, what, and of course you did. I mean, you know, I mean that's the thing. It's like everyone is trying really hard. Everyone's swinging for the fences because they know too that it could be their last Marvel book. Or when, whatever, but or their last ash can or whatever. When I was doing uh, Arkham Asylum, mm-hmm. um, I was throwing everything in the kitchen sink into it because it was my first chance to really do a DC superhero thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, who was your artist on that, Dan? Oh, Ryan Sook. He's amazing. Yes. Jesus Christ, um, of course he is. <laughs> yeah, the uh, working on that, and there's this point like the halfway point or two thirds in where suddenly it pulls a switcheroo on you and you think you're what you're reading a book about, uh, you know, Oz in Batman's world where it's like a prison drama mm-hmm. and suddenly it becomes this supernatural <laughs> zombie thing. And it was because Etrigan, the demon lived in Gotham and I thought it would be cool to have, uh, and it's set up in the first issue that when Arkham Asylum was in the day and age of, you know, uh, drilling holes in people's heads to get out demons, that if Etrigan had some kind of link to Arkham, and then it comes full circle where these demons are getting out, you know, from the mad people, and Mm -hmm. Etrigan has to do X, Y, and Z, and Etrigan becomes like one of the heroes of the book. And I thought this was so cool. And I was – so like that was the left turn. And I was running all this stuff by people and they're like, you're telling this really good prison drama. And I, we know you set up the Etrigan thing at the beginning. But you just, just go ahead and do your thing. Dude, just tell your prison drama. Don't do this. And I was telling people like, no, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be like dust till dawn. You think it's this, and then halfway through, bam, vampires. Yep, yep. Dust till dawn. I'm doing dust till dawn. And I kept, like, pitching it to people over and over. When anyone, other writers or other people or editors would try to talk me out of it, I'd be all, dust till dawn. And then I did it, and it's getting drawn. It's coming in, and I'm seeing, oh, I should have listened to everybody. And then I kind of had this horrible realization. And the realization was, I didn't like Dust Till Dawn. (laughs) (laughs) Wait a minute. I've been pushing this movie that I really didn't like. (laughs) I'm an idiot. (laughs) Nice. Hilarious. Hilarious. (laughs) 
man. Do you want to do you want to say anything about Silver Surfer? Because I know I've been keeping you forever here, and I, it, dude, I'm loving the conversation. So well, no, the, uh, really appreciate where we've been going in this conversation. I I just had a talk with with Mike Allred today. We were just, uh, you know, about about Surfer, and he said something that that really blew me away. Um, he said it's because with with Surfer, um. Uh, I it's I put all this love into Surfer and uh, unlike Spidey we we kind of wait till the issue is ready and send it out and it it hurts our schedule but we're so happy with each you know issue that I don't think we've dinged one yet and we we never really stop to put on an inventory artist or an inventory writer because let me tell you Mike Mike Allred has never missed the deadline on this it's all been late because of me okay. uh, but at no point have we ever s- switched things up just to get out an issue and because of that um we're we're currently working on issue 12 and we did so like 20 27 issues in a row okay um same writer same artist on one title and all red said to me he was like this is the longest clean run i've had with no other inventory artist, you know, no one, no one taking this stuff. And I'm like, really? It's like, yeah, even on Mad Men, on Mad Men, I had Look. guest people come in and it's my own book. Wow. And he's so, he's so happy. He's so happy that he's had an uninterrupted run. That's great. Of, of working on this character he dearly loves. Um, I'm so happy to be, this is like my longest run working with one artist. Um, and you develop a relationship and a rapport, um, and and so much of uh, the you know we, there will come a day because we've seen you know that where we aren't doing server, it'll happen. And when the, when this happens, it's kind of like this is one of the best relationships I've had with an artist, and and so much of that is due to the fact that. The Allreds are the nicest people on earth. I can appreciate that. Go on. <laughs> they're they're just they're they're sweet. They're kind. They're uh, they're generous. They're uh, beyond creative. They're positive about everything. They're just so like I was talking to Mike about like movies and TV and stuff, and there was like an episode of something we were referring to. Very much, uh, we were Darmok and Gelotting. <laughs> yeah. uh, I hate that goddamn episode. I know everyone loves that episode. I hate yeah. that episode. We, 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 were, we were doing that to... Uh, and Tanagra. Shaka, and Tanagra. When the Rawls fell. Yeah, I know. Arms <laughs> wide. The, <laughs> when we, were, we were kind of doing that to, to shorthand getting <laughs> through a, a story. And he was not getting this reference that I knew he'd seen he'd seen and Mike was like, yeah, my memory's not that good on some of this stuff um, anymore. And then in the most Mike already way, he said, which is great. Cause it means everything. Every time I get to watch something, I get to see it new. Exactly. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> no, Mike is the, there's gotta be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> he, he's that everything. And, and that right, attitude right. That attitude, you just, it's so, it, it's the greatest thing in the world. I'll get, I'll get happy because I see I have an email from Mike because I just know this, I'm going to open it and, and sunshine and rainbows are going to come oh, out. That's cool. That's, you amazing. know, well, it comes through in the art, man. It comes through in the, in his art. Uh, it, but he and Laura, because really they're, I mean, they're drawing the hell out of this. They're killing, they're killing on every, you, oh, it's just so, oh. I remember when I had a shitty laptop and you were trying to show me like a, a double page or something like that uh, a, year, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and it, it, unfortunately my laptop was too small and shitty memory. So you, when you even tried to like send me a, whatever they were drawing, I, I couldn't appreciate it until I finally saw the book and I'm like, oh, this is what Dan was talking about. And really the last issue, number 10. Uh, oh, that right in the middle of the book, that that great double page Galactus uh, you know, uh, thing dirt. that, you know, for people who haven't read it, you got to pick up issue 10. It's uh, such, it's a self-contained story. I mean, it's it, it comes out of the ashes of, 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 of the previous story, but it's it really is this beautiful. Is it only 20 pages? 
it's it's only twenty. Man, it's it's great. It it has everything, it, and it's beautiful, and a great wrap up. And I it, can only imagine where we're going from here. It was written backwards um, because. Uh, you screw you. You read the book. I'm spoiling it. Screw you. You should have bought it. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's there's the adventure they have, and what the the adventure they have is secondary to the wrap up. I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the adventure they have is sec. The wrap up is what's important. So it's almost like I will write my Marvel movie, and it will be ten minutes long, and I will do. An hour and fifteen on the post credit sequence. <laughs> you know, it's it is super self indulgent. It's this truly romantic and epic ending yep. where if you were doing a movie, you could show it and it wouldn't eat that much real estate. But when you do a comic book, every big visual you do eats up physical pages. Sure. So what it really is is it's a very short, like six page, seven page story, with a, a thirteen to fourteen page epilogue, which is just it's glorious. And yeah. I, when I described it to Mike, he was all so happy. Oh, that's he, cool. He could picture how it all worked in his head, and um, th- there's stuff we do in there that plays with the format of comics, with, with using this giant where where Surfer and Dawn are at opposite ends of the universe. Yep. At, by the end of the story, and they will never see each other again. Um, and the way I wrote it in the plot is, I want like when I was um, growing up in England. Uh, one of the blessings was we got to go to the theater all the time. We got to see the Royal Shakespeare Company all the time. Cool. And I remembered uh, there's a uh, scene in, in Henry V where um, the the supporting characters have to go to war. And the way they staged this, they had, they had the curtain to the proscenium closed. Okay. And they had everybody doing all the acting, uh, all the scenes, up until they, these, the characters head off to war, everything on the apron of the stage. Minimal, uh, minimal set pieces or chairs or things, just everything there, boom, on the apron. Okay. And then the characters have to go to war, and they pull back the curtain, and it is an empty stage. And the characters who are leaving, saying goodbye to their loved ones, do a diagonal cross from the apron all the way to the far back of the stage. And in your mind, the stage had become the apron. That that was the totality of that space in your head. And when they opened up that curtain, even though it's the size of a normal stage, the cross that those characters take was the most epic trek There was so much physical space that you felt this longing of the loved ones who were whose whose family was going off to war. It was sad. I hear you. Um, We do that like we do that on the page where Dawn and Surf are on opposite ends of the universe. And in the plot, it's we're cutting the each page in half. So there is at least the space of a physical page between them that is nothing but white gutter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's it's four small panels crammed to the side over there of Dawn on one end of the universe, you know, lamenting she'll never see the surfer again, and surfer crammed over to the far side about how he'll never see Dawn. And and the visit it's crazy about comics to go, we want to kill this much real estate of nothing. You know, it's like the you see John Byrne do it. You see Walt Simonson do it where they do those stories where all the universe gets destroyed and you're left with a blank page. Yes. The Kovac. What if where it was where? Yeah. What if Kovac beat the Avengers and it ends with him kind of absorbing the universe 
and, and it's a and he uses, yeah he uses the ultimate nullifier to kill himself and everything goes to nothing it was very disturbing uh, when i was 13 reading that <laughs> yeah cuz you're so used to a, you're so used to a busy page yes yes but if you if you say to somebody we're going to make you pay it for a comic and you're going to pay for a page of nothing there's there's a feeling you stupid <laughs> <laughs> i did not feel cheated i did not yeah. feel cheated yeah there there's something there's there's power to the negative space i um I had a uh, I was an art return guy for Marvel for uh, like a year and a half, two years. Uh-huh. And there was an artist, nice guy, who had an agent that everybody hated. <laughs> and there was one of these stories where everything gets black, you know, knocked out and you're left with a blank page. And the agent fought Marvel like a son of a bitch going, my guy is getting paid for that blank page. That is a page he is being paid not to draw. You must pay him. The act of not drawing the page is something he is doing. And Marvel gave in and paid the guy for the blank page. So, like, you know, in the book, it's mocked up. It's got the title of the thing back in the day where you sent the pages to the printer. Mm-hmm. Marvel physically sent the blank page with the, uh, you know, the story title stamped on it. And, you know, all the blue lines are there for nothing. Right. And as the art returnist, I get the book back. And then I have to separate the book between the penciler and the inker and send them the original art back. And it's a it's a two it's a, a one third split to the inker and two thirds to the penciler. Um. So I get to this book and I hit the blank page and I'm not sticking the anchor for the blank page. Sure. <laughs> he only gets a third of the book. Right. So I, I, when I split the book, I put the blank page in for the penciler, you know, and I send that out. Um, and, and the agent comes into Marvel and he is pissed. You gave my guy a blank page. And it's like I had like uh, some bigwigs in there, possibly Grunewald. Uh, I can't remember who if it was Grunewald or Potts or even the Falco. But it was, I had everyone was in my office. We we're arguing with, with the uh, with the agent. And it's like, did your guy get paid for the blank page? No, I mean, my guy can't get the blank page. And it became this whole big argument. And I I got to be Solomon. It was great. I got to go. Wait, I, I have a solution. I have a solution. What if we take the blank page out? No one gets the blank page. No one gets it. And everyone's like, all right. And I'll split it like a 21-page book instead of a 22-page book. And Because usually it was um, – the split would be 14 pages to the penciler and eight pages to the anchor. Okay. And I go, okay, what if we treat it like it's a 21-page book? And everyone is fine. And they're all looking, we're looking at the agent and the agent's like, that's fine. So I take the one page back and I hand him the exact same packet back. And he's looking at me, but why don't I get a page? He's like, you split a 19 page book. It's eight pages to the anchor and four and 13 pages to the penciler. And there's like silence. And the agent goes, give me the blank page. <laughs> Exactly. Did, did you? Uh, I, I don't want to spoil it. I feel like I'm spoiling it. If you if you read Saga and you haven't read the latest trade, if you if you you know. No, I saw you raving about it, but go on. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm spoiling the end of Brian K. Vaughn's book. <laughs> you know, but if you read it in singles, you've long since read it. If you haven't read it in the recent trade, uh, hang up. Click click this off because I'm going to spoil it. <laughs> I hate it when people spoil things that aren't I there. I understand. No, I, I I think the audience will appreciate the warning. So, yes, yeah. go. This is, this go is Brian, Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples. Amazing. It's like my my favorite, uh, you know, non-Marvel DC book. Sure. Um, is is I read I read Saga and Walking Dead in trade. I hear you. It's uh, – so I'm re- you get to this point where – all these, you know, the, Brian K. Vaughn in Saga is is George R. R. Martin ruthless. You know, where he nobody will kill. Safe. Yeah, yeah, nobody's safe, and he'll kill longstanding characters. And uh, he introduced all these these new characters, and then our heroes have to leave while it's very much 
<clears throat> everything on this planet being destroyed. And one of them is this boy that our lead character, Hazel, little girl, uh, had her first kiss with. Like one of her friends. They they could have escaped and they didn't. It was very much like a Christian science thing. Okay. Of we we are trusting in God and God will save us, even though the flood or the something is coming. Sure. And they leave and they're all wiped out. All these characters you you cared about, they're all destroyed. And with the on with the cataclysm. And the narration is saying that, like, of, you know, all these people that lost their potential, like all these stories you'll never hear, all these, like the friends you lose touch with, all these things that they never come back into your life again kind of thing. And and the destruction was very much this wave of, like, black, inky stuff filling up everything. Okay. And you get to the end of this talk about, like, all the beautifully written all about – I'm not doing it justice – about all the potential that people have that you never have when their lives are cut short or when your time with them is cut short. And then it, that character is overwhelmed, like engulfed, like they're going under in the blackness. And then they just did five pages of black pages in a row. Wow. And you, 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 you flip each one. Sure. <laughs> and you're being moved by nothing. Wow. You're being, but the, to their credit, you know, I think the way they they pulled it off. I went back and I counted the pages because <laughs> you, when you're when you're a writer, you, you deal so much with the real estate. Of sure, it. absolutely, and, and all the bits and pieces you had to leave on the floor because you didn't have enough room. And and when you see pages being wasted, it it eats at you like a cancer. Um, so when I was, I wanted like, did they, did they lose page? No, they, they, those, four, those blank pages, they sucked it up on what probably would have been house ads that you still got a full, you know, 20 to 22, 23 page story. And they slapped on five extra black pages Wow! to get the effect. They did it on purpose. They got the effect and they didn't rob you of any pages that you had. I hear you. Know, story. That's awesome. <laughs> There are so many things where you – almost every plot I write is usually three to five pages heavy. And then I have to go through and I have to slay my little darlings. Oh, I hear you. And, and leave stuff on the floor. It kills me. In, um, in Clone Conspiracy, mm -hmm. um, there was one joke. It was a joke. And – I tried to fit it in almost every issue and with almost every subsequent issue, it was the first thing cut. It was always the first thing cut was this joke because it took a couple panels to tell it. It was funny. If we had done it, people would have remembered it. But at the end of the day, it didn't progress the plot um, where it's the jackal and uh, another person uh, talking about all the Miles Warren clones Okay. Because Jackal, you know, the guy with the Anubis mask, who we later find out is Ben Riley. Surprise! Right, 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 right. Um, <laughs> he is, you know, he has taken his tormentor, uh, the original Jackal, uh, Miles Warren, and just made a zillion Miles Warren clones. And they're his, they're his servants, yes. his lackeys, his minions. Um, had a gag where they were coming up with terminology for the clones in the way that uh, you have a litter of kittens, a murder of ravens, sure. uh, you know, um, a clue of worms. You, the, the way you have those definitions, they were trying to come up with what a grouping of clones is called. And the argument was, it's a warren of clones. <laughs> <laughs> and the other guy going, no, it's miles of clones. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so they're having this who's on first kind of argument about, no, miles of clones. The clones more. are having this argument? No, no, a Jacqueline. Oh, Jacqueline, uh, the person he's talking and, about. And the and third party are having it in front of all these clones of Miles Warren. And I just love that bit. And it ate up a page and it did nothing to the plot. And it. Every single issue of Clone Conspiracy, everyone's, every single issue of Amazing that tied in had that joke land on the floor. Oh, well. You, you know, just <laughs> scraps of the meat you didn't use in the sausage. Um, 
uh, there, there's there, every there's so much stuff like that. There's so much stuff that ends on the floor because you're you're wedded to 22 pages of story, which then eventually became 20 pages of story. Yes. And I remember talking to Wade, and you know, we, we, when it, it hurt us because we're such old fogies um, that we we're so used to for decades writing for 22. Sure. And telling you now you got to write for 20. You know, he got over it way faster than I did. I, it still stings. I, to me, it's like phantom limbs. Like, I, I, like sure. I, I want those two pages. I need those. I was talking to Roger Stern, and he was telling me, like, he wrote during the age of 17-page stories. Yes, sure. And when he was working on Spider-Man and it went from 17 to 22, he was the happiest man in the world. And his take was... That is five more pages I get to spend, not on Spider-Man, but on Peter Parker. Interesting. And I was like, oh. Wow. You, the minute you say it like that, that's like, oh, that feels so good. It's like, talk dirty to me, Roger No, Stewart. I understand. Dude, <laughs> I, you know, I was Five in- more pages of, 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 of all that would – we there was, there was a bit that I freaking loved in the first five issues of Silver Surfer with, with All Red that – we did not have time or space for it, and it killed me. Where um, when Don Greenwood gives her tour of the Greenwood Inn, mm-hmm. one of the things they have on the wall is a stuffed and mounted fish, but it's a tiny fish. It's not like a big sword fish, sure. right? It's this tiny fish, and like a guest is like. What is that? And she's giving the tour, and she's like, oh, when Albert Einstein stayed here, that's the fish he caught. That's Einstein's fish. You know, it's, it's, it's who caught the fish, not how big it is. That's awesome. And it's set up, and there was going to be payoff to it later, where at the end of an adventure in the first five issues, when they're back, when they're at the Greenwood Inn, uh, Doctor Strange and the Hulk had to help, so it's kind of an informal defenders team up. Sure. And... Uh, at the end of it, I was going to have them on the tour in the background, you know, like getting it because it's, you know, to have the weirdness of Doctor Strange and the Hulk, like getting a tour of your New England Inn sure. while Surfer and Dawn were having plot talk. And there was going to be the bit where someone goes, oh, this is Einstein's fish. And I was going to have Doctor Strange hit it with the eye of Agamotto, the beam that, you know, the power of the eye of the Agamotto is truth. Okay. Everyone keeps forgetting that. It's not time. That's the movie. In, in the comics, it reveals truth. Uh, that's the way it originally was. And I was going to have him open up the eye and shine it on the fish. And the fish was going to turn and be alive for a second. And, uh, and Dr. Strange was going to be, is that true? And the fish is, yes, it is true. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Never got to do it. It does jack shit to the story. So it got cut. I love that we had the scene with Einstein's fish. We set it up. We did not get to pay it off because there's no room. You had to defeat the Lord of Nightmares. You had to free everyone on Earth. The <laughs> surfer and Don had to have a moment. They had to say goodbye to the family. They had to head off in this space. There was no time for a three panel to, you know, Einstein fish joke with Doctor Strange. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I understand your your concern over real estate because that was you know you might remember in the press conference for Clone Conspiracy. I'm the guy going, is five issues enough? Are you guys gonna be able to do everything you need to do having this kind of premise and the conversations that need to take place? And like you guys said, it, it ended up happening. A lot of those uh, the d- the detailed versions of those happened in Amazing Spider Man. Yeah, we had the, we had five extra issues of Amazing. Yep, do that. Uh, uh, Good stuff, Leonard. All right, I like it. <laughs> uh, no, hey, hey, dude. Honestly, I know we've we've been uh, we've been going on for a while. Now. I have a feeling this is going to be a two parter uh, because of oh, it. God. But that's okay. Hey, no, why, why, why? Why would see? It's fun for me to talk to you. Well, it's, you know, and it's and and the gab and do all this stuff. And I'm like, who would want to listen to this? You know, honestly, Dan. <laughs> yeah, but all right. Uh, I, I've got you know dozens of hours of Bendis tapes and slot uh, discussions. We oh, don't have a name for our talks. Oh, oh well, don't. Okay. <laughs> But no, honestly, Dan, what, what, people what, love what, when we what, do this. They really what, do. And they love the fact that there's no time limit and we can go off in our tangents that we do. And people are, you know, this is this is how they get to know you better. You know. Uh, John, let's talk about ancient Sumerian texts. Well, no, but that's the thing. We don't talk about that. We talk about Doctor Who paperbacks and all that. And all yeah. the Who fans go nuts and they love it. 
And uh, no, honestly, and especially too, thanks for thanks for addressing the uh, established the core characters and the legacy stuff because I do think that's an interesting discussion. And again, I appreciate both sides, and I say, you know, be Solomon in that case and say, hey, let's give everybody what they want and do both. I, I and, you think, know, so and I see you you likely feel the same way. I, I think you you uh, I'd much rather have it we we do the diversity but I think the deal is you can't do it all at once. Right. You can't you can't it, I I think it's a lesson we've learned is you know you, you can have one thing um off status quo but yeah we you, you got to give them the crap mac and cheese you got to offer the burgers and fries. Yeah man. There, there's certain reasons why you you keep coming back into the same restaurant ordering the same meal. You 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 can change it up. You can change up one thing on the menu, you can change up a couple things, but you know, it's it's weird. Um it it, it it's I get so impressed whenever I see Marvel stuff get nominated for Eisner's next to uh indie stuff. Sure. Because what we're doing at Marvel, we're doing at any, at any of the big two, you know, you're, you are doing mainstream, you know, you are doing, you are the, you know, how many billion burgers served. Yep. So when right. we roll, when you roll up the sleeve and, and you produce the McRib, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and people love it and you go, Oh my God. And suddenly everyone's going to get the McRib, it, you know, that, Oh, it's so nice because, you know, the flip side is, you know, the guy working on the indie has, you know, scraping, scraping together whatever he can to get it out. It is a labor of love, doesn't have the safety net, doesn't have, you know, is really big uphill battle in many ways. Uh, But the flip side is the people working at the big two have so many hoops to jump through. Absolutely. to, To do what you do that. When when you when you do that thing, you know, I saw I saw someone like ripping into me because of how low Silver Surfer sells, and it's like I don't care. <laughs> I I care enough that we want to keep doing it, but that's not why we're doing it. I understand. Um, you yeah, know, Hickman, Hickman said. Uh, I've I had this quote again in a recent episode. Uh, books are on the shelf for different reasons. Uh, They're on the same shelf for different reasons, and I think he's right. And I think you know, like you just illustrated, the creator-owned book and the mainstream book—they they compete for the same dollar, but they are on the they are on the shelf for different reasons in terms of you know the hamburgers and fries that uh, DC and Marvel produces, and and the the passion projects that a lot of the creator-owned stuff represents too. Yeah, I, I, every it's it's weird. Every now and then, I I, I hear the siren call of uh, of creator own, um, and there there are times where I'm I'm told, you know, many times rightly so, you can't do this with our character, mm-hmm. you know, because you know with someone like Spider Man, he he is footy pajamas and lunch pa- lunch pails and stuffed animals that kids are hugging when they go to sleep. There are certain things I shouldn't be able to do with Spider-Man. There are certain things um, that we should do. Uh, it's 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 a balancing act. Sure. And and you go in knowing that, and that's also part of the game. Um, it would be so easy um, if I wasn't getting paid by Marvel. If I wasn't working on this character I love. Um, you know, if I was in a world where it wasn't about money and it wasn't about um, and I didn't have people overseeing me, I would do this great fanfic. <laughs> I could tell every story I want and then people would be, oh, that was awesome. But and then you go and you do your thing and someone's like, we're doing this fanfic of the thing you're doing and we're so much better. And I'm like, if you tried to do what I was doing, you would be fired. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you would you would either you would either have to learn how to play the game, or be fired. You wouldn't get to tell that story over here in in, the, in this book. You you that's an impossible thing. Um, it's recently I tried to have this talk very frankly with some fans and saying you know people are like he's he's you know 
uh, being unreasonable or he's taunting. I'm not talking. I was just being very frank and honest about why you weren't going to get the marriage back. That, you know, you could go over here and you could write a fanfic about getting the marriage back in core continuity, but you weren't going to get it in the book. You just, it can't be done. There's so many different things. There's so many different political minefields to dance through. Um, you know, someone could win the lottery tomorrow and try to buy Marvel from Disney, who's the world's biggest marriage fan, and it's still not happening. You know, there, there's so many different roadblocks in the way. And when you try to explain this to a fan and you try to just be frank about it, they don't want to hear it because now you're insulting their dream. Right. Why, why won't you let us have our dream? Right. Yes. And I'm like, yes. I'm perfectly happy with you to have your dream, but don't use your dream as a metric to go, why isn't he doing this in the comic? I respect that. Because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. more often than not, I don't want to. <laughs> I understand that too. No, no, absolutely, yeah. man. Tell your story, Dan. We like it. Uh, no, you don't. I do. I, son I, of if I didn't, if I didn't, you wouldn't be back on Word Balloon. We would have only done that one conversation about the thing <laughs> eleven years ago. You're you're a you're a you're a you're a big softy. No, no, hey man, no, I'm a, hey man. What are you talking about? I, there there are creators that I love that are working on books that I do not give a shit about, and they're good people, and I would love to have them on, but I do not want to half-ass a conversation where I'm really not invested in the book. And, uh, and I mean, that's that's just the truth. And God, that's why, like, Val Delandro, when he finally was doing Bitch Planet with Kelly Sue, I'm like, oh, uh, my God, you're out of the X world, Val. I'm like, I know how good you are. And it's so good that you're doing a book that you give a shit about and Kel does. And it's great. And I'm just not an X-Men fan, as our War Balloon <laughs> listeners are well aware of, unfortunately. <laughs> it's it is oh man, there's so many stories I want to tell. The the uh, but it's weird. It's like there's so much stuff I have to. Part of my job, and it's a real hard part of the job, is the stuff you got to keep in the box. Sure. You know, like sure. for example, like I knew every beat in Secret uh, Empire over a year ago. Okay, there's things that I can't say or certain conversations I can't have because it'll spoil someone else's story mm-hmm. or secret plans down the road. Or it, it's very, it's very frustrating because then I'll see something in comic book news where someone will make a educated guess and treat it like a fact, sure, and then write a story, and I'm like, oh, you're wrong, but I can't jump in and say that without ruining secrets. Right. Well, God, you experience it yourself with all the heartfelt, you know, goodbye Peter Parker oh, God. blog articles that I'm just like, really. Oh. Are you new to this fucking party? Where the hell have you been? Where <laughs> characters die and come back? Okay, I, whatever. There, there is, there's the number of people that didn't. They say they get it, but that just in there said Captain America is the villain in this story. He's the bad guy. <laughs> this story is going to be about people fighting fascism. You know, uh, yes. I saw it's so many people were treating it as if it was something that was celebrating fascism. I hear you. I know. And no, I know <laughs> it's the exact opposite of that. How can you not see this? And then, then there's the argument of um, you're not listening to our hurt. We are feeling hurt. Right. The Captain America is a symbol. Captain America was created by two Jews. Yep. Yep. Captain America, how dare you make us hurt? Yep. And you go, you do know that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, though Stan Lee did not create Captain America, but you do understand that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby did a story where the Red Skull brainwashed Captain yep. America and made him see how to Hitler. Yep. They even put that in the Marvel superheroes cartoon, for Christ's sake. And and That's it was a multi- story. And it was a multi part story. He was still Siegheiling Hitler and then to be continued. So there's this argument of, well, that's a finite story. Well, you know, end of the day, Secret Empire is going to be a finite that's story. Exactly right. You're just in the middle of it now. Yep. Oh, you're 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 glorifying this. 
No, you're not. Look, no. look at even the stories where he is. He's bad. Well, it's the character created by Jews. Well, yeah. Stan and Jack did this, and then these other stories. You know, you had the story where he, there was a version of Captain America even has a, a swatch to call on his shield for Christ's sake. The, you know, written by other. It's these. It's it's so bizarre. Part of it, it's because of the internet. And everyone has instant reactions. Yes, and a platform and, to and complain. a platform to get to, to get it out there. Yes. Can you imagine a world where something like Star Wars? Yes. Came out and there was internet. Oh God! Can you imagine yeah. the first week? Who are these characters? Stormtroopers. Why can my child buy you know action figures of stormtroopers? Yep. You know, like you can get upset about anything. Oh yes. Um, yes. N- no, but like you can find a way to twist anything to make you know. And and I understand Marvel's a big target, and I I understand that yeah, well, you you don't want to see Captain America be the bad guy. Sure, you don't of course see not. Him be this Hydra fascist. Yeah, uh, you you know, same way you didn't want to see Spider Man be Doc Ock. Right. You know, there was. There was a um, the equal amount of well, not equal amount. There, there was there was a fair amount of of you've ruined Spider Man forever articles, and how <laughs> dare you take this beloved childhood icon and do this to him? Yep. You don't understand. Why does Dan Slott hate Spider Man? Yes. Yes. Um, one of my it's it's weird. Um, our letter at the time, Chris Eliopoulos had his, uh, you know, the lettering up on his computer for issue five. And that's the issue where uh, <laughs> Superior Spider-Man pulls out a gun and shoots a guy in the face. Okay. <laughs> it's a bad guy. It's a mass murderer. He's a mass murderer. He shot a mass murderer in the face with a gun. Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Don't say it's hilarious. Well, you know. Yeah, I, I, I know I know what you're saying, but oh, my God. I understand. Don't, John, don't get me in the soup, John. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but it, it, the art for that was up on his screen, and his little kid walks by, and his little kid sees it, and his little kid freaks out and goes, "Spider Man doesn't do that. Spider Man doesn't do that." And then the book sees print a month later, and all these grown men on the internet were going, "Spider Man doesn't do that." Yep. And it was like, "Oh my!" It's I can make that joke, you know, which. Yeah, it happened, but I can I can make fun of it. But at the same time, I go through all the same stuff. Sure. But I get to do it behind the scenes, and you don't see it. Like <laughs> I I I remember when uh, Civil War was coming out, and I was working on She Hulk, and I got to see scripts ahead of time, mm-hmm. and I saw that scene where Peter Parker unmasks, and I read that in in, in you know script form. And I had the biggest fan freak out. And I, I was like calling Brevoort like, what? You can't do this. He, he takes off the mask. He, Civil War isn't going to stay the way that it is forever. And everyone in the world knows he's Peter Parker. He's taking away his secret identity. Well, 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 bad guys should try to kill Aunt May and Mary Jane. And yep. Everyone he loves. And dude, this is the most irresponsible thing. Peter Parker. Blah, 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 blah. You know, and I was foaming at the mouth over, over this story. And, you know, people at Marvel walked me through it and talked me through everything that was going to calm me down. And then like, oh, oh, and this will lead to this and that will lead to that. And you'll tell these stories. OK, I see where this is going. OK, fine. I, you know, my, no, no, no. Go ahead. But, but then it's all the stuff I can't talk to people about because it's in the box. Well, true. But and, I was, and, let, me wait, redeem, wait, wait. let me redeem my wait, uh, wait, 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 finish, wait, finish, finish, finish. And then I go online, and everybody is having the reaction I had. Sure. And I'm being the person going, oh, calm down, and rolling my eyes. Oh, look at them overreact. And then someone has to point out, you know, you did the exact same thing. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll let me redeem my Straczynski complaint about Superman with what I really loved about Civil War and Spider-Man. And while he was writing Spider-Man, when Tony first convinces him to go on his side instead of Cap's, and Peter says, "Tony, the everything in my every fiber of my being is telling me that I'm wrong to do this. But you're, cl- I know you're smarter than me, 
So I am going to go with you. That said, if it turns out that you're wrong, I'm coming after you. And I thought that was such a great Peter moment where he forgets how self-conscious he is. And that is full-on Spider-Man threatening Iron Man and saying, I will break you if you're wrong. And then after the reveal and when Kingpin tries to kill Aunt May and that fight in the prison, that's a, I mean, and, you know, I just thought that was a great, great scene. And it's just like, wow. And we wouldn't have had that if Peter hadn't it, unmasked. So yeah, it's, 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 we, there's all these things where like, I, I see it three months ahead and <laughs> sure. I freak out and then I come to terms with it and I get a hold of it and then I go, okay. And then everyone online freaks out that I am <laughs> such a canary in the coal mine. So a lot of times, like I'll be arguing with someone online. What I'm really doing is arguing with my past self and trying to get them. <laughs> Trying to get them to where I am, and it never works because end of the day, I can't open up the box. Sure. I can't, you know, I can't show you the secrets, or I ruin other people's stories, or or Marvel will fire me, or whatever. But yeah, it's that's the hardest point, and then so much of that feels like you're towing the line. You're not towing the line. You know stuff that other people don't know. It's frustrating. Right. No, so frustrating. I understand, man. Episodic storytelling and. That's why it's like, don't start complaining till after the story's done. Then, oh, but no, no, no. You know, no and really, the story's never done, too. Yeah, yeah, but you, you try to make that argument, and you get the, no, 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 you don't tell me how to feel, and you I. don't get the right to do this, and oh, yeah. I'm allowed to feel this story in the moment, sure. and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's, it's just, you know, it's just <laughs> lesser, it's a lesser version of criticism when you're yelling about the story and you're only on chapter two. And it's like, okay, I mean, again, hey, man, a lot, of, hey, a lot of clickbait and a lot of people, you know, a lot of eyeballs go to those kinds of internet articles. God bless you. I, I can't, I, 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 I'm sure someone will find an exception where I have fallen into that rabbit hole, but I just oh. don't like doing it. I, re- I really don't. What, what I hate is when they do that kind of story and like, it, you know, on a, on a site and they start telling that story, you know, that when they do the bare minimum boilerplate, of I know these are temporary stories. I know these are sequential. You know, when they go in and they do that, I know this is serial. I know he'll probably come back. But let me tell you why I'm I'm hurting. Yeah. You're like, oh, you just ran right by what's actually going to happen, and you know this. Yeah. Know this. Well, so at some point, you you know, it's you're really getting on a soapbox to push an agenda that you can co-opt this argument or this feeling to promote this other agenda of this other thing you care about uh, it gets so frustrating you know i guess you know it's uh, the the thing that someone would should say to me or do is it, very much the um the war games thing you know the only way to win is not to play yeah yeah no <laughs> hey man i understand i shouldn't stick my oar in i shouldn't stick my nose in and try to (laughs) gauge yeah and try to fight this fight that i'm not gonna win and that i can't bring out all my ammo because it's locked in the box sure you know and that's oh you know i don't disagree dude i understand and i and i like i said i i appreciate your your candor on online and uh you know just tell your stories that's all you can do yeah but okay. Okay. all right, and, and no, good, good conversation, good, good stuff brought up, and uh, keep keep doing what you're doing, Dan. Keep it up on Spider Man. Keep it up on Silver Surfer, and uh, whatever's in the future, we we look forward to it. And uh, when uh, when you'd like to promote, or when I see something that catches my eye, I guarantee you we'll uh, we'll have this conversation again. Oh, thanks, John. There you go, Dan Slot. Great conversation. Always happy to have Dan on. Looking forward to the next one, and I hope you enjoyed it today. On Word Balloon. Brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you very much, League, for your continued support and uh, truly appreciate it. Uh, If you uh, like what you hear on Word Balloon and uh, can help me out, uh, that would be great. Uh, Go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or right there at wordballoon.com. Um, you know, I, I really, I've, I've gotten a lot of new subscribers. I, I truly appreciate it. And uh, the sponsors are also uh, starting to uh, help out, uh, the existing sponsors, and uh, really happy about that. Um, I'll tell you who uh, is doing it as we get closer 
to the event. But I didn't think I was going to be going to Comic Con this year. You know, because again, I'm 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 on a part time job. It's it's helping pay the bills. The Patreon people uh, as well are absolutely helping me out, and I truly appreciate that. But uh, you know, I, I wasn't going to go to Comic Con if I couldn't afford it. So uh, a sponsor called and wanted to uh, talk about doing some panels. I explained that I wasn't going to be going because of the cost. And uh, they offered to uh, fly me out and uh, put me up. So that's excellent. I, I Man, very cool. You know, obviously, this sponsor is also a listener. And uh, it's greatly appreciated. So I am able to, uh, through the graces of this sponsorship and some really fun things that are coming up for Word Balloon, uh, we'll be able to make the trip to San Diego. So that's cool. That's great. And, I, and I, doors are opening for Word Balloon. And um, I don't know, honestly, what they will mean and what they will represent, frankly, both financially and uh, opportunity. But it seems like doors are opening. I will, as these uh, projects that are popping up start happening, uh, I will be talking about them on, on the podcast in the future. But, um, you know, we'll see. And, I, and it's really great. So uh, it's, a, it's a very good time for me here at Word Balloon. And I'm very uh, appreciative of uh, the sponsors and uh, also the, uh, the, the you listeners as well, the League of Word Balloon listeners, and uh, you know even even people that just listen and can't afford to uh, contribute and everything. Totally cool, you know. I mean, just just let friends know because as the audience grows, more people are going to want to do business with Word Balloon. And um, you know, I, I I believe in Word Balloon. I think it is entertaining enough as is any comic magazine that is still on the stands. Uh, any uh, information-heavy uh, podcast that talks about the comics industry. I will stack up these conversations with anybody out there. And uh, I'm glad that the the podcast arena is becoming more information-oriented. And I think that's necessary. And it's, it's really great to uh, be part of that. So anyway, all meant to be. Thank you. I'm very grateful to the support that everyone is giving to Word Balloon right now. And uh, it's, it's helping uh, evolve Word Balloon and uh, keeping me afloat. So really, thanks very much. That's all I have to say for today. We got a, another great episode coming this week because Free Comic Book Day is coming. And I got to get J.K. Woodward in there to talk about his uh, very cool Star Trek run that's coming up for IDW. A mere universe story featuring uh, the Next Generation cast. And uh, we had a really fun conversation about it. Gee, you know how much I like Star Trek. And uh, this is a terrific conversation. So, J.K. Woodward on the next Word Balloon. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2017.